dynamics. Dynamics, the word in general, uh, especially as used in engineering and phys physics, means systems undergoing change. Now that's very different than the way things were in statics, the class that led into this. In statics, we had two things that were always true. Well, it's not so much at the start, but by the time we got to the end of the term, two things were always true in statics, and that's that the forces would sum to zero, which of course means, three dots there means therefore, uh, therefore the acceleration was zero. And also the moments would sum to zero, And, uh, uh, well, to, to jump forward a little bit, or actually jump back maybe a little bit, if you remember from Physics 1, if the uh, moments summed to zero, then that meant that the angular acceleration was zero. And that was always true in statics, that we didn't want things accelerating in any way, whether it was uh, in translational or rotational <coughs> acceleration. In dynamics now, and uh, we're looking at, at mechanical dynamics as opposed to thermodynamics, fluid dynamics, or chemical dynamics, which are other courses you may come across in the next couple of years. It's uh, possible that either one of those sums won't be zero. And I say possible because there are situations where the sum of the forces actually will be zero in some problems that we're looking at. A good example of that is if we're looking at uh, uh, the motion of a car tire as it rolls along. If the car is moving at steady speed, then the tire itself is not accelerating. The forces on it are summing to zero, but the tire uh, is rotating, so there could be angular uh, uh, acceleration of, uh, of some kind, uh, especially if there's slippage. If the tire's slipping with the road, then we can have those situations. But in general, we're now looking at situations where the objects will accelerate. And that's the main difference between what we did in statics and what we did here. So this statics had a lot to do with structures because uh, it's so important that they don't accelerate. Whereas in dynamics, we're going to look at all kinds of things, lots of different things over the... Uh, over the term as we go through this. Um, this is going to follow very closely the type of thing we did in Physics 1. Most of you I had in Physics 1, so you'll remember that. Um, this will be sort of like a Advanced Physics 1. We're going to go over some of the very, very same stuff. It's just we're going to go into it uh, uh, more deeply. And I'm going to entrust that you will be developing some, some greater intuition in some of the things we're going to be doing. Uh, if you remember back to then, we did then, and we will now start with kinematics. We'll do that uh, for objects treated as uh, points. So, uh, um, maybe we can put it that way. And that's the, the very same kind of thing we did in Physics 1. We're, if we're worried about the, the position, velocity, acceleration of uh, some kind of object that has some finite size, like the space shuttle or uh, a car, <coughs> we're not going to be worried about the fact that uh, the, the bumper is going to be at one place and the, the steering wheel is going to be someplace else and the driver is going to be someplace else. We're going to treat the object as a single point um, to begin with as we do as we do uh, as we go through the first part of the kinematics that we're going to be doing. Then we'll look at the kinetics of the situation. Remember what that business was? Phil, yeah? 
Once we've looked at the position velocity and acceleration, then we have to concern ourselves with how do we get a particular acceleration. And that's when we brought in uh, to play Newton's <coughs> laws. In this class, especially as we go through the first part of the class where we treat objects as, as single points, uh, we will never have uh, a force balance of zero, we'll never have an acceleration of zero. Then we kind of go back and go through the whole thing again for rigid body motion. And that's just like we did it in, in physics one. We did things in that very same order. Uh, the difference is uh, when we get to rigid body motion, We'll do like we did in Physics 1, where we look first at rotational motion. Um, that'll start with the kinematics of rotational motion. But if you remember Physics 1, we stayed there. We didn't do anything other than pure rotation or pure translation. We will finish the course with general motion studies. where we will allow things to both translate and rotate at the same time. The very motion a, a car tire makes as it moves along the road. And any parts of that can have some particular acceleration involved with it. And those are the type of things we're going to look at uh, as we go through this. So certainly a uh, uh, good portion of the first bit that we're doing here is going to be review from Physics 1. So bear with it. If you feel you got that more than adequately put away, good for you, but uh, we will be moving on from there fairly rapidly as we, uh, as we get through things. So we're going to start with the rectilinear motion. the rectilinear motion of a single point representing any object we want to have in the problem. Rectilinear motion is a fancy way for us to say 1D motion. Once we get to 2D motions, things get a little bit more complicated, but not terribly. If you remember from Physics 1, uh, once we started looking at 2D motion, it was possible things could accelerate in one direction, not in another, as an object in uniform circular motion does. It doesn't accelerate along its own path, but it does accelerate normal to that path at all. <coughs> so things become a little bit more involved once we get to that, but not terribly so. So the first thing we need to worry about is the position of an object and how we represent that. To uh, relate the position of any object, there's one thing we need first and foremost before we can do anything with it. Remember what that is? You do, Alan. I know you remember because you were always the one in physics who wanted to say it. What's the first thing we need when we're talking about the position of any object? If we have some object represented by a single point that happens to be right here, we can't talk anything about the position until we have an origin. Or a reference. An origin. We have to have some place from which we're measuring everything. Where must that origin be? Anywhere. Anywhere you want. Sort of anywhere. Same initial point. It doesn't matter where it is as long as we all agree on where it is because otherwise it's, 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 uh, it's useless for us to talk about the origin if we don't agree where that is and all positions relative to that. None of it makes any sense. But it can be arbitrarily chosen. So we'll just simply pick an origin somewhere and we'll measure the position of objects relative to that. So. We might call that our first position vector. Remember, all vectors all 
all vectors have three things. What three things? Phil? New units. Uh, units I don't like putting up first. I need direction. All units have direction, as this one does. It's represented as a somewhere right of the origin. They have magnitude, not only am I right of the origin, but I'm a certain distance right of the origin. And then once we have that magnitude, it's meaningless if we don't have units on the number that represents the magnitude. Now, for uh, rectilinear <coughs> motion, we don't need to do anything more than what we did in physics 1, which is call one direction positive and one direction <coughs> negative relative to that origin. So we'll do nothing more than that. Plus or minus will be enough to give us the direction of a rectilinear, an, an object in some kind of rectilinear motion. So here's our first point there. I arbitrarily chose it as to the right of my arbitrarily chosen origin. And we'll see it, say it's there at a time t1. Sometime later, of course, it might move to here. So at some time t2, it's going to be there. And now there's a new position vector. to represent that. Then whatever numbers might be associated with that, whatever distances might be associated with that. And then of course, uh, we're interested in things that are changing, so we have this changing position. The change in that position vector and Hopefully you remember at all times when we use this delta symbol, it's always the second one minus the first one, or the later one minus the earlier one. It doesn't have to be just one and two. If we want to skip point two and go to point three, we could do S3 minus S1. Just as long as it's whichever one comes later minus whichever one comes earlier. And that would give us just that change in position which is a vector itself because it does have a direction and this case happens to be further to the right it does have a magnitude it's changed by that far and then once we have some magnitude we always have some units this is specifically known as the displacement between point one and point two, whenever and wherever those were, it underwent a displacement, in this case as shown. That's different than distance, the distance between point one and point two. How so? Displacement's a vector. If we take the magnitude of the displacement vector. And I'm not going to write the vector sign. I'm not going to write the vector sign and the magnitude symbols. I'm just going to simply take the vector sign off uh, rep to represent merely the magnitude in the units, no sense of direction. And that's how we use it. Anyway, if I ask you the distance to New York City, you tell me it's whatever it is, 180 miles. You don't say, well, it's 180 miles in the minus J direction or whatever anal thing engineering students would try to get in there and use. It's just sufficient to say what the, what the distance is between the two. And after that, perhaps it goes to some third spot Again, its position measured from the origin. <coughs> and 
now we have a second displacement, so maybe we need to call that delta S1. Call that delta S2, perhaps. Whatever symbolism you need to use to keep it all straight. It is certainly possible and legitimate that we're concerned with the displacement between 1 and 3, and we don't care what happened at 2 for whatever reason. If that's the case, then we have a different displacement vector. Uh, maybe we'll call that one three. Maybe one of them A, B, and C. I don't care which one. But we can do this displacement between any points we want. They don't have to be the two points in order. Once we've done that, of course, we're interested in how fast this displacement is occurring. And so we divide it by the change in time. And that we call, nobody knows, velocity. velocity. Not just velocity, this is the average velocity. Average velocity, because we're only concerned with the position at two discrete time periods. Uh, we don't care what happened in between, if anything. It's just not a, a, a part of the concern when talking about average velocity. have to be a little bit careful. The book <coughs> uses a bar over the V to represent average velocity. Um, then they use a bold face for a vector, and I think even a bold face italics, and that's just more than I can manage at the board. So, of course, this will mean vector. If uh, I'm using average, I'll write average here down below rather than put a little bar above. And then uh, if it's a scalar or the magnitude only, I just take off the vector sign. And uh, hopefully, as you remember, if we look at these <coughs> two positions, some t1, some time where our first point is at a certain position, happens to go a little bit farther in the plus direction. this average velocity is the slope between those two points. Doesn't mean it didn't do a lot of other stuff in between those two points. It's just those are the only two points where we perhaps happen to have data or the only two points where we perhaps happen to care anything about what's going on. However, there usually is a lot more going on. Perhaps the, the path of the object is actually described by something that does some more like that, and there's a lot more information in there that we need. The question then became, and it became exactly this for Newton and Leibniz back in, I believe, 1690 or something. At some particular instant in time, when it happens to be right there, wherever that might be, what was its what is its velocity at that point in time? And this was a, a, a philosophical point that up until the time of Newton and Leibniz, they thought could not be answered. Because there's no way that we can go down to a single point in time and have any displacement in that time. If no time has gone by, how can any motion have gone by? That was the philosophical st stance of the scientists of the time, and they believed there was no way that if you went down to an instant in time, there could be any such idea of a velocity at that time. Kind of like uh, uh, what's called Zeno's paradox comes in a couple different forms. It's the idea 
that if uh, you have to go from one point to another, the first thing you have to do is cover half the distance. Then you have a little bit of distance left again, so you're going to cover half of that distance. Now you have a little bit of remaining distance, and so you'll cover half of that distance. And so on and so on forever, you'll never actually reach the point you're trying to get to. Because you always have to do half the distance. What? That's why my life's work. Yeah, it's kind of like school. We, we make you always go half the distance to your degree, and you'll never ever get there. But of course, we know that that's not true. Nowadays, we have immediate proof of that. At any instant, you look down at your speedometer, speedometer on your car, and it is reading something. So even though delta t goes to zero, we know that the ratio itself does not necessarily go to zero. And that's what Newton and Leibniz gave us when they developed calculus, this idea of the instantaneous velocity. And I'll draw the velocity v without any uh, designation of average on it. Same kind of thing the book does. Again, they have to leave, put a little <coughs> bar over it. Um, I'm not going to bother with that. And that's the business of the, uh, as you remember from Calculus 1, <coughs> that the slope of the tangent to the curve at that point is found by this, and that indeed is the instantaneous velocity. We don't want to write all that, so uh, Leibniz, I believe, was the one who suggested we use that notation. Um, I think he's also the one that called it the derivative or the differential. Uh, I believe Newton called it fluxions. And that's the instantaneous velocity, the t time, instantaneous time rate of change of the position vector. Uh, even that's too much to write, so it's very common in science and engineering to use this designation of putting a dot over it. Any, any uh, term with a dot over it means the time rate of change of that, that quantity. So this is time rate of change of the position vector. Anybody remember what the fundamental theorem of calculus says? has very much to do with this. It also has to do with one of the ways that speed traps work out on the freeway. It's not so common anymore now that we have radar guns, but when I was a, a hyperactive teenage driver like most of you are, uh, we'd see signs on the highways that said, uh, speed monitored by aircraft. They'd They'd have planes flying over the freeways, and they'd time us at one point, wait until we went, and just went to some other point, maybe between exits, and they knew the distance between the exits, and they could figure out then the average velocity between those two points. But a couple people tried to say, oh, but no, I know when I got to that exit, I got off at that exit, I was only going 20 miles an hour. I couldn't possibly have been going 80 miles an hour if I was only going 20 at the exit. But what's the fundamental theorem of calculus say? You remember? Oh, it addresses this. Fundamental theorem of calculus says that between any two points, if you know the slope, and there's a continuous function between those two points, as your position time graph must be. It must be continuous because you can't change positions without uh, a certain amount of time going by. Somewhere between those two points there must be a slope of the curve that's the very same as the slope between the uh, two endpoints themselves. Somewhere between 
here and there, there must be a point, and it looks like maybe it's right about here is one of them, where the curve has the same slope as the slope of the endpoints. Does that kind of sound like the fundamental theorem of calculus? No, evidently not. Chris, doesn't it? Sounds like intermediate value. Intermediate value theorem? Oh, well, it was fundamental when I took it. Anyway, so uh, it didn't matter what you said your speed was at any one time, that if your speed was the average between those two points, they knew that somewhere in between you were indeed speeding <coughs> as well. So even if the speed limit was much less by the time you got to the exit, the fact that you got to that exit so fast indicated you were speeding elsewhere. All right, uh, fourth part, that, that velocity vector for statics that was a constant, for dynamics this class is going to be uh, quite variable. So as we look at how it varies with time, we then come up with this idea of what we call the acceleration. In this case, the average acceleration. Between two distinct time periods, we look at what the velocity <coughs> is. How that velocity changes is the uh, acceleration of the object. This is a lot less intuitive than is velocity. Velocity we're very familiar with. Uh, if nothing else, we always see it registered on the cars. Acceleration is a much less intuitive quantity, and you have to be a lot more careful with it. There's a lot of times when it's uh, negative, when your intuition would say it might not be. As we take the limit of that as well as the time period goes to zero. Then we get the instantaneous acceleration. If you need an idea of what it looks like uh, when you see the needle on your car moving, the speedometer needle moving, uh, depending on which direction it's moving and how fast it's moving, can give you a bit of an idea of the acceleration. Of course, we don't want to write all that, so we write the much simpler form of DDT. Of course, we don't want to write all that, so we write the much simpler form V dot. But remember, V itself is a time derivative of the position. But we don't want to write all that. We're very lazy people. You guys should be thrilled to be going into this field because of how lazy we are and how often we come up with simpler ways to write things. Of course, we don't even want to write all that. Since it's the second time derivative, we can, if we want, write double dot. And that's a very commonly understood uh, form of notation that we'll see, uh, that you'll see throughout your career. Um, especially common in, uh, in heat and mass transfer subjects where you have mass flow rates and heat flow rates. Uh, it's very, very common to use the dot notation in that. All right, sound kind of familiar as we go through this? Yeah, uh, here so. Is that a hand? No, it's a ruler. All right. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's see, we got to do a couple things now that we didn't do in Physics 1 because things are getting better. Now that we have this notate, this, this, this uh, reviewed knowledge uh, of velocity and acceleration. <coughs> Since 
this class depends upon that acceleration not being zero, that's the one we'll look at the most. We're going to look at three particular cases where we have some acceleration. Uh, one thing we didn't do really at all in Physics 1 is look at changing acceleration. We'll look at changing acceleration a lot more. The first one we'll look at is acceleration as a function of time. And it doesn't matter what order these three things are in. It's just the uh, order I have them. We'll also look at acceleration as a function of position. Both of those, uh, very often, uh, the acceleration of fun function of position has a lot to do with the way you drive. You only accelerate at certain places. Uh, you always accelerate away from a stop sign. You always accelerate into it. Um, well, the reasonable drivers of us will actually stop there. So we'll accelerate into it and accelerate out of it. Uh, time isn't necessarily as common. It's a, more like a rocket launch might be that at certain places through the launch, certain times through the launch, the, the uh, acceleration is a certain value. Um, more likely it's a combination of the two because uh, as position changes for a rocket launch, so does the gravitational field change, so does the mass of the object. Uh, so it gets a little bit more complicated in the real world of doing these engineering things, but all this stuff is. And then the third one we'll look at is acceleration as a function of velocity. This is what happens for the most part with um, uh, drag. Drag forces as one object moves through the uh, fluid. Uh, the drag is a function of the velocity and the acceleration is a function of the drag and so you get uh, this intertwined idea of these two things going between each other, which leads to the course we call differential equations, where you'll start to address that, that third case. But we can take a, at least a, a, a preliminary uh, cut at it. Don't change the camera. Okay, thanks. See if that works. software nothing happens, so we'll see. Good thing we got a pro here and knows how to push a button on thing make it work. Alright, so the first thing we'll look at is, is acceleration as a function of time. Probably the simplest of them. Um, in that if we need to see what happens with it. Well, if acceleration is a function of time, let's put those two together. <coughs> and I'll leave off the vector signs for now because the integration of a vector doesn't make quite as much sense, uh, though it's, it's just sort of a technicality. Um, and then we can integrate between V1 and V2 integrate between T1 and T2 and we have the ability to is this nothing more than what we might have thought anyway that the change in velocity is the area under the acceleration time curve so if we have the acceleration as a function of time, we can now figure out what the velocity changes are. We can't necessarily figure out a specific velocity, but we can figure out what the velocity changes are. Um, if we're given one of the specific velocities, then we indeed can figure out then what the changes are. But between T1 and T2, 
the area under the acceleration curve will be the change in the velocity. One thing you need to be careful with <coughs> is the possible situation, oh sorry, that's, yeah, that's acceleration. Uh, the possibility that we have an acceleration that happens to turn negative for a while That is positive area, as integrated, will give you a positive change in velocity, and this is a negative area, will give you a negative change in velocity. So just as they integrate in positive and negative senses, it still carries the physical meaning that we need in terms of what happens to the velocity. So as simple as it is, there's the, the first case And not much more really that we can do with it than that. Well, there is. There's a little bit more we'll get to in a, in a second here. Well, case two, the possibility that uh, the acceleration is a function of position isn't too terribly much different. See, so yeah, acceleration as a function of position, and the acceleration is, again, still just dv dt. But uh, we can't really regroup this because the, we don't know, we're not talking about a velocity. The velocity would change with position but it's the acceleration as a function of position that we're working with, so we can't really change this around to uh, recombine variables and just simply integrate like we did over here. We could do this because acceleration was a function of time, but we can move things around a little bit <coughs> to get to there. So it doesn't seem like it's much help, but remember that velocity itself is a time rate of change of position. And since these things are all happening at the same time, then we can solve both of those for the time component, set them equal to each other, eliminate the time component, and we get dv over a equals ds over v. Doesn't seem like that's a, a huge help. But we have some more rearranging to do. We can collect variables so the velocity thing parts are together. We can also put the acceleration over with the position component, since that's the function we have anyway. And then we can call this vdv equals a ds. Or if you prefer, s dot ds dot equals s double dot ds. Now that we can integrate. Let's bring it back up here. All right, just rewriting it there. And uh, uh, if you're doing something besides rectilinear motion where we truly need a two-dimensional <coughs> vector, it's not a big deal. Both of these are done in either the component directions uh, as needed. All right, so we can integrate this between V1 and V2 and integrate this between the two endpoints and presumably we know something about how the, um, ex the acceleration is changing with position in there. 
What's this integrate to? Because we can do this integral without knowing what the velocities are. Since it's velocity is a function of velocity, we can integrate that. Joey, you don't like to integrate anymore? This will integrate to 1 half v squared between the limits v1 and v2. Is that right? Yes. Now you see it. Now you see it. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, are you familiar with this notation of the integration limits? <coughs> okay, good. This one, we can't do anything with that other than say that's the area under the AS diagram. So if we have our acceleration as a function of time, whatever that might be, the area under that graph is one half change in the quantity v squared. Now, I don't know, that might not look like it helps a lot. It's not as obvious as the area under the AT curve was. Um, <coughs> anybody recognize this one half V squared quantity? Or sort of recognize it? Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. Uh, actually, it's what we call the specific kinetic energy. It's the kinetic energy per unit mass. So, that could be a little bit of help then. This is the change in the specific kinetic energies. Change in the kinetic energy per unit mass of the, uh, of the object. Now, a couple little bits of warning here for... Uh, for for you from someone who's pretty pretty experienced in teaching this. This is an easy one to forget that it's it's available to us. It's not one you've seen before. Uh, it's there's some times when it uh, if you remember this, it'll solve the problem you're working on in, in a couple short steps, where if you don't remember it, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. So that's the first warning is, don't forget this beast. Draw an arrow by it and a box around it. David, I'm going to check yours. <laughs> the second warning is this business here. It has to do with delta V squared. That's what we have here. We put V2 in, minus squared, minus V1 squared. That is not equal to delta V squared. V squared is V2 minus V1. There's delta V, and then if we square it, and those two sides are not equal to each other. In a class of 11, at least two of you will make that mistake. Call these two things equal. Who are those two? Does anybody want to volunteer for that right off the start here? Alan, didn't you do that in Physics 1? Never. I think you did. Never I did, and I never will. <laughs> All right. Just, just don't forget that these two things, these two different sides, are not equal to each other. It's a pretty common thing to forget for some reason. I'm not sure why. Just because you're young and impulsive, I guess. It is a little easier. I guess to look at that side and want to do it that way just because there's one less exponent. But 
is not necessarily correct. If V is zero, it's correct, but that's a pretty boring problem. All right, we'll do a sample problem here. Between two plates, let's say we have an electric field, and uh, We'll just keep it simple now because this is not an electrostatics or electrodynamics class. We just want to look at, at what happens to an object whose velocity, whose acceleration is a function of position. So let's imagine we have these two electrically charged plates about 200 millimeters apart. And right in the middle, we release an electron from rest. Electrons, in case you didn't know, are blue. They're green. So, they're what? Who said they're green? They're green. Turns out they're green, they're blue. So we release it from rest right there at the midpoint and want to know then what the velocity is. when it strikes the plate. And I'll give you the acceleration as a function of position. Let's just say it's 4s meters per second squared, where s is the position measured from the first plate. All right, so. So S1 is 100 millimeters, midway between the two, <coughs> two plates, and T1 is zero there. That's where we'll start the problem. And we release it from rest. And we want to find out what the second velocity is. So we can use this because right there is the second velocity we need. Um, we can go ahead and, and sketch that out. Then we've already done that integral, so let's not belabor it. We know that the left hand side integrates to that. And then that on the right hand side will be the integral of that area with, or sorry, acceleration with respect to position. We know the acceleration to be 4s. And between uh, the two positions. Actually, now that I think of it, this wouldn't work with the plates charged that way, would it? I don't know what I would do. Because, because if it was here, it would stick to that plate, the acceleration would be zero. If it was down here, its acceleration would be the greatest, but it would be in the opposite direction. So whatever the plates are, there's some magical electric field between the two plates. Maybe a magnetic field would work better. Doesn't matter. We're, we're looking at the up pure dynamics problem of it. And so from that we can find out what V2 is. So take a quick second and uh, do that. Figure out what V2 is. We'll put some magical charge on these plates then. All right, you can integrate this side the 4s and then solve for v2. Remember this 4s is in meters per second squared. The limits are in millimeters as written. So you've got to straighten that out. Boycotting. Uh, just that you, if your acceleration is 4s. Yeah, seconds. 
where it gets a little confusing. It's four times, it linearly increases with position. Yeah, where so up position here is the acceleration is zero, down here the acceleration is four times, times your that. So wherever you are, it's four times your current position. Yeah. Per second. Yeah. Okay. And so that puts some odd units on this four because S will be in meters, so this is, uh, or S is in millimeters, right? Well, for it to work here, it'd have to be in meters. Always convert it, right? And be careful, there's two S's in there, one for seconds and one for... It's just a, a, a straight linear function. Alright, who's got it? Bill got it? I had uh, 0.346 meters. Um, no, no meters. Meters per second. Meters per second. 0.346? Yep. Yeah, that looks like, looks like uh, what I've got once you change the limits. Anybody get anything radically different than that? Okay, slightly different question, and this one isn't as straightforward as that one was. How long does it take to go there? How long does it take to cross that half the plate, starting with a zero velocity and reaching uh, uh, and reaching the bottom plate 100 millimeters later? That one's a little bit less intuitive. To get the delta t, we need dt. But remember the dt we, we don't have there now. We eliminated that, but we can put it back in if we remember that that was ds, the change in position with time with the velocity, and then we could do that now if we had the velocity as a function of position because that's what we're going to need to do this integral. To do this integral we need velocity as a function of position. We have acceleration as a function of position but since the acceleration as a function of position is known we can also find the velocity as a function of position. To do that we go back to this side and generically integrate it not between the two positions but between the start position and any other position. Then we'd have the velocity as a function of <coughs> as a function of position. Where now we generically integrate up to some position s, 
that will give us the velocity as a function of position s. Okay, so we can do that. Let's see what happens. Uh, raise the power by one, divide by that, we get uh, four over not s, four over two s squared. Is that right? Yeah, one half s squared evaluated between 0.1 meters, the initial position, and just some generic end position, S. I think I lost a factor of two somewhere. No, we're okay. So then integrating that, we get V equals 2 yeah, 2s two squared minus 0.1 squared. That's, oh, and then that's all square root. Uh, no, just the parentheses for. If you do that integral, do it between those limits, you should get that. And then, now you know that velocity as a function of position, and you can do this integral all the way down to the end plate and get the delta t. Sorry, it's one over then. One over that velocity. And you could do that integral. We're not going to do it here. It's not the point of this class. Uh, you might remember it involves a log function. Double check that you get 0.658 seconds. So a quick example of a uh, problem where the acceleration is a function of position and we need to pull that into it to solve it. But it can also be done for the time, even though the time is not a function of, uh, is not an explicit part of that uh, relation. What's left? Case three, right? This was an example with case two. This came from case two. The acceleration is a function of position. That's how we got to there. So case three, acceleration is a function of velocity. Much more likely if we're talking about Fluid drag. As the velocity goes up, the drag goes up. As the drag goes up, the acceleration goes down. As acceleration goes down, the velocity changes in different ways. So we have to keep all that in the problem. Now, this splits into two, uh, two possibilities. One is that de delta T is in the problem. Either it's given or it's asked for. Now, that's not the situation we had here because here it was not acceleration as a function of velocity like we're talking about now. If uh, delta T is in the problem, then 
it's uh, simply a matter of using the relationship that, that we already had. that you then just integrate for it. Where we have the velocity-based integral on the other side. So we can find out delta t from that, just uh, a straight integration if we know that acceleration uh, as a function of velocity. That's not the area under the acceleration velocity curve that describes this, because this is one over the acceleration, not the acceleration directly. <coughs> and the other possibility is that delta s is in the problem. It's either asked for or it's given. Now what? Now what do we do? Oh, God darn it. Didn't I tell you you'd forget this? And I put a box around it, draw an arrow to it, and say, don't forget this. And then you forgot it. The reason this is useful is if air, uh, acceleration is a function of velocity, we can recollect the variables. Then we've got the ds on the side that we need to integrate. And we can finish the problem. Directly by just doing that integral, if we know the functional form of the acceleration as a function of velocity. That one's hard to draw, not really anything I can do with that. So we can solve the three possibilities, assuming that those three uh, situations are exclusive of each other, that we have the acceleration <coughs> as a function of time, but not as a function of time and position. All right, uh, a, a quick uh, review of the special situation, that of not functional forms of acceleration other than if the acceleration is a constant. And if you remember that led to uh, four acceleration, constant acceleration equations and then uh, we'll do lots of problems with constant acceleration. So not in any particular order. If uh, acceleration is that as it always is and it happens to be a constant then it becomes nothing more than acceleration is change of velocity with time. In other words the average acceleration and the instantaneous acceleration are the same. actually are all vectors. Uh, however, when you do it in its component directions, uh, you can just use the straight equations. All right, we have the, uh, uh, let's see, so that's, that's, uh, that's actually special case one, uh, uh, case one with Acceleration is a function of position. We also came down to uh, this equation when we got to it.
However, acceleration is constant, then it comes out of this uh, integral as a constant. You can just finish the integration in there. Or then solving this in a form that you're a little bit more familiar with. V2 squared equals V1 squared plus 2A delta S. So now we have two constant acceleration equations. And we know there to be four. So we've got two more. Actually, we're at the end now, so we'll save the next two constant acceleration equations where they come from for, uh, for Friday. You're right. I have a different schedule every year. I guess I was hoping to get lunch before a technical for and sketching. It's not going to happen. All right, so uh, let's see. So there's there's two of them. The third one, uh, well, we we kind of have to develop it uh, ourselves. If we have a velocity time graph with constant acceleration, what does that graph look like? If acceleration is constant, what's the velocity time graph look like? It's linear. <coughs> I'll go ahead and draw it like that. And so between two times t1 and t2, we have two velocities, v1 and v2. And the change between those is linear. Then the third equation is that the average, the mean velocity, just the distance midway between those two, is uh, equal to that midpoint. In other words, uh, the average velocity, which we know to be delta S over delta T, is just simply the arithmetic average between the two velocities. And so that's our Third equation, again, not in any particular order. And then the last one, and then we'll stop, because that's a more natural stopping place. And I got you all excited for stopping anyway, is uh, a little bit different formulation than you've probably seen before. We know that the change in position will be uh, the integral of dv over between v1 and v2. That's just that uh, that form I uh, I given you before. I told you you'd forget, and you did already. ADS equals VDV. But if the acceleration is constant, it can come out of the integral. And I'm going to do a little step here with V2, since the acceleration is constant. V2 is going to be V1 plus a delta t. The velocity v1 is going to change by an amount, a delta t, because the acceleration is constant. Now, that we can integrate to get the position, 1 over a here. This integrates to, what, 1 half v squared between those two limits. And I've got the 1 over a on the front, 
Oh, might as well put the one half out in front as well. So a one over two A. And then uh, just square the parts in there. Let's see. V1 squared plus two A V1 delta T plus A squared delta T squared. Right? That's that's the top limit squared. Took the A out, took the 2 out, took that limit and squared it and we got that. Minus, it reevaluated at the lower limit, well that's just V1 squared. Okay so far? No, no goof ups? Well, we have v1 squared minus v1 squared, so those two things cancel. Gets a little tidier. Uh, the 1 over 2a, we can now take through. We've got a 2a there, so those will cancel. We get v1 delta t. The 2a goes over here, we'll have the 1 half. We have a squared. But one of them will cancel, so we have just A, and then we have delta T squared, and you have the last constant acceleration equation that you probably recognize. Delta S equals one-half AT squared plus VIT.